everybody. Good evening. Welcome to episode 11 of Beer and Bastards, the greatest show ever created on the interwebs. I just want to let everybody know it's the new medium now is the internet. This whole cable stuff, you know, with the CNN and Fox News, that's going on the wayside. So you're watching the future, the libertarian future here and live in front of your eyes. Um, I want to welcome our guests, um, Jay Wilson from A Libertarian Future. The first time. Oh, we got nine now. Um, there we go. We got nine people that are very concerned about what's going on in the world today. I'm proud of you guys. Francis McCloskey Fran here. And his Francis is here so we can start the show. All his Marxist <laughs> rantings. I can't wait to hear that. I lost um, <laughs> Jay Wilson is the, uh, the creator of A Libertarian Future. He also uh, has his own website. Uh, and he does some interesting work. You wrote you wrote plenty this past week on Rand Paul, right? Jay, can you hear me? Shit. I can't. Anyway, hear you. we'll move can along. You hear me? I can hear you. Um, you can't hear me, so that figures. That's technical issues happen. You know what you can do, Jay? Just refresh, and then I'm gonna go around and introduce the other guy. So click the refresh button. Can someone else tell him to do that? Jay, refresh. Hey Jay, hit the refresh button. Ah, I hear you guys. I can't hear Will. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully he hits it. Anyway, I'll move on. We have uh, Grant Phillips from A Modern Libertarian who wrote a great piece on why McDonald's raised their minimum wage, which you should all read. It's very good. And it, they did not cave to uh, Marxist pressure, crazed you hear that, Marxist McCluskey? pressure. You hear that? McC yeah, McCluskey, put that in your pipe and smoke it, pal. You <laughs> Marxist. Um, <laughs> and the legendary uh, Michael Lee is back in the United States of America, who was in, he was in Belgium for a while. Um, Belgium, which is really Holland, but it's really Bel- I don't, I'm lost on where that is. Um, is Belgium a country? Do they speak French? Yeah. Do they speak Doug? What goes on there? Really? They speak both. Is the food really as bad as everybody says it is? Depends on what it is. Herring. Some How of is it, the yeah. herring? No one likes I, herring, I, though. No, I don't, I don't think anybody does. Does everybody wear clogs? Yes, yes. That's mandatory. It's actually against the law not to wear clogs. I, I knew they would have some weirdo status law over there. Clogs and voting status. are the only two things that are mandatory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How is the red light district? Can you divulge any details, or do you have to keep that a secret? Oh, well, we won't. We won't get too far into that. Let's just okay, let's just cool. keep that to the side. I don't know why I brought it up. Um, Mike Lee is the purveyor of Being Liberal Logic, um, which is a really good page. It debunks most of Being Liberal's senseless, idiotic memes. Um, Jay's back with okay, us again. Um, and then there's me, Will Riccadella, um, co-creator of The Analytical Conservative. Um, some people like to call it The Analytical Neocon or The Analytical Statist. Um, also, I'm a analyst at Unbiased America, which is, some, which is sometimes called uh, Neocon Biases Confirmed. Um, Tonight we wanted to get into, you know, Rand Paul's announcement, which is the big thing. And we kind of want... Jay, you can hear me, right? I don't think Jay can hear me, so I'll just... He'll riff off of you guys. Um, I'm going to start with Grant here. I want you to talk about your piece, though, a little bit, Grant. Can you tell us about what happened with McDonald's and and why they eventually raised their... their what they offer their uh, entry employees? Go ahead. So uh, McDonald's raised their wages about a dollar, but only for uh, about 10% of their locations that are corporate owned. The reason is because the other 90% are actually uh, franchisees, so McDonald's doesn't control their wages. Uh, many people have the misconception that McDonald's somehow responded to social pressure, uh, but they've been getting this social pressure for, I can't, I can't even tell you how long, I mean, a decade or more maybe, maybe or way beyond more. that. Um, yeah. But what's really happening is, and we've, we're seeing this more than once, I wrote a piece before this one about uh, Walmart and Target doing the same thing for their entry level employees, uh, is firms are starting to want to reduce turnover to improve customer experience. 
by finding that balance between a higher wage and not having to raise prices. So I think they might have actually took a few few items off the dollar menu, but that doesn't completely block out their low income customer base, which is a, a huge part of their business. So essentially, uh, so, so hold on one second. Turnover. Hold on one second. So what you're saying, Grant, is that they're trying to get employees that are more productive, a little bit more productive, without raising their prices per se. Well, not necessarily more, not necessarily more productive employees. Just trying to make their existing employees more productive by reducing right. turnover. So it's not like they're going out and, and trying to trying to compete for higher wage or right. higher wage labor. They're just trying right. to. Uh, um, reduce turnover. I mean, the turnover is like 150 percent, which is huge. And with right, and without that turnover, they don't have to. They don't have to. It's a high cost to train employees, correct? I mean, that's a right. big investment it, it, to train somebody. And but, it's a well calculated decision from their financial department to sort of find that balance, like I said, between how high can we raise our wages without our customers being affected by their price. And a lot of people were comparing them to In and Out Burger, which has a very successful high quality burger chain restaurant and essentially uh, their average meal was over six times or, or like three times the price of a McDonald's meal like just a burger there cost six dollars wow. you know so wow. so really the, the comparison between the two is not even remotely accurate at all yeah, uh, but still, uh, it, exactly and, and, and you know that's something where if you work at McDonald's for a low wage then you move to In-N-Out Burger where they pay you 10, 15 an hour right. as opposed to 725. Right. And very, it was a very good piece. I was surprised somebody of such a low IQ and such a heinous face as yourself could write such an interesting and insightful piece. Speaking this is the of heinous. I, I, I could hear that you could read. I didn't know you could read. I mean, <laughs> good job. Touche. <laughs> Touche, young Grant Phillips. Touche. <laughs> Speaking of heinosity and ugly faces, um, I want to move along to Michael Lee. And I want to get on the topic, and I eventually want to get to uh, to Jay here. I want to move on to what's been pissing me off all week, certainly in social media, and that's libertarian purism. Okay. Um, <laughs> so what we have here is Rand Paul. Rand Paul announces his his candidacy yesterday, and you have, I mean, which is a majority anarchist. Some are just poll bots. But let's just say it's all to the right of, say, your mainstream libertarian. Um, certainly, some of your hardline libertarians will support will support Rand Paul as well. But I mean, it's mainly the the the, the hardcore hardcore poll bots from 2012 and ANCAPs. And I mean, they're they're trashing the guy. I want to talk about how they're trashing him before I get into the GOP establishment. I can't figure out who I hate more, but certainly the GOP establishment is far more powerful. But Mike, can you speak to the purists? And can you give a convincing argument as to why they should accept, say, a Rand Paul, and perhaps I, I don't know, you know, try to change the Republican Party within the primary system? Can you give a decent argument for that? Well, I think I think there's only one argument against libertarian purism. If libertarians want to ever have any influence in the near future or ever in American politics, they're going to have to accept that not everybody is exactly the same as them. And if they can't accept that, well, then they'll just be a silent voice as they've been for the last 30, 40 years. We won't hear them. If they can't accept a little bit, if they if they want to be a pure candidate, then no one's ever going to hear them. And that's what they're going to have to deal with. No change for them. So basically, they're making themselves irrelevant. Yeah, they're completely obsolete. If they're not, I mean, you look, if you're a liberal, you have to accept that maybe one of your candidates isn't going to have there's been liberal candidates that have been uh pro life for instance there's been liberal candidates that uh have supported free trade international trade and if other ideologies had that same attitude then they would be just irrelevant you know we'd have 17 candidates and no one would ever gain any traction libertarians right. are the only one that do this though so instead right. of getting some of their ideas to the forefront they get none of their ideas to the forefront right well, I'm going to dismiss that argument as purely a neocon argument, okay, Michael Lee, because that, when people usually do that, that means they win, I think. Just say it's neocon, claim you're the winner, and uh, you've changed the world. Um, Jay, uh, you're the most li purest, you're the purest libertarian I know. Um, I know that you support Rand Paul. What's going on with your brethren here? Why are they, why can't, why don't they like the guy? Um, and why can't they, I mean, what, 
do they think they're going to get everything they want? Are they utopian at heart? Go ahead. They're just unwilling to compromise. They, you know, the, the whole point of the Libertarian Party is that uh, they call themselves the party of principle, when in reality now they're just the party of pettiness. I mean, they're attacking people like Rand Paul, who could do more for liberty by winning in 2016 than the Libertarian Party's done for liberty in the past 40 years. But they just Ever. don't want to compromise because they're principled and et cetera. And they say, if you compromise on your principles, you don't have principles, yada, yada, yada. But principles haven't done anything for the past 40 years for them. So apparently right. their way is not working too well. Um, you, you know, here's the thing, I, you know, and I hear it on, God, it pisses me off, online all the time. Oh, the drug war. Oh, you know what I mean? Here our republic is crumbling. We have a lawless president. We have a bloated administrative state. We have Congress that delegates duties to the executive. They don't, they're, they've become unhinged from the Constitution. And people are screaming about pot. I, it's, it's mind boggling. And we have it's a great a candidate deal. like Rand. It's, okay, you know what's a big deal? Tyranny is a big deal. When the president what circumvents do you call the, the war people. war on drugs? That's tyranny. The war, no, no. The war on drugs is not tyranny. The war on drugs is a policy dispute, one that could be made on a cost benefit analysis. You're, the, the, the government has it's usurped tyranny. the rule of law. No, no, no. The government has usurped the rule of law. That the, where, where, in the, where in the Constitution does it say you have a right to smoke pot? Where, where in natural it say law the does the government it say? has the right to tell you what drugs you can and cannot take? It doesn't. The war on drugs okay. is inherently no, you're unconstitutional. Saying, you're saying Just, no, no, no. It, hold on, hold on. If they had right. to pass a constitutional amendment to ban alcohol, you know, no. They, they had no. to pass one to ban alcohol, no. but they didn't have to pass one to no. ban marijuana. You do not, you do not understand the law. They ha the federal government had to pass it. To, the federal government had to pass that to ban alcohol because it came from the federal level. The states can ban alcohol. Any state right now can ban alcohol if they want. Okay. But the federal government it's banned a federal it. Federal war on drugs. Forth. It's the schedule. Well, uh, federal right. schedule what is, drugs. But right. let's go to Grant. Right. Would it, would it, hold on a second. What does the federal government stop? Commerce, right? They're going to stop drugs sure. at the border whether they're legal or not. They stop them at the border. So they, they grow right? drugs in Colorado. They, don't allow, they, they, do, not, they do not allow them to come. In. That's, that's a legitimate function of the federal government. Is it, whether you agree with the policy or not, which I disagree with, that is a legitimate function of the, of, the, of the polity is to stop drugs at the border. Go ahead, Grant. All right, so okay. the Constitution. One of the Bill of Rights says what? Freedom from excessive finding and excessive punishment. Personally, I would classify nonviolent drug use and minimum mandatory sentencing as excessive punishment. Right, that's a different oh, argument here. That's whole that's oh, wholly oh, yeah. a different argument. Okay. okay, that's not the argument I'm on here. I'm on that he's telling me that you have a right to smoke pot in which you do not. Oh no. You do not have a right to smoke I, I, pot. I you, you do not have a right to methamphetamines. Right. You, you, right. Which you do not have a right. I have a right. You do not have a right. I have a right to, you do not have a right to prescription what medication. What I want. It's self-ownership. No, no, as long as I'm not hurting no, someone no, else, you, me consuming whatever I want does not affect anyone else. Right. It's it self doesn't. It doesn't affect, your, does it affect your family. I own my product. Does it affect your family? No. Does it affect your family? Does it affect your community? It if you're can. a drug addict, does it affect your community? It can. It can. Okay. So now you so just said it doesn't, but it can. Which one is it? Which one's what? Does it Again, like you said? You that can is a cost can't. benefit analysis. That's are cost are there externalities analysis. to you? Are there externalities to your community? So you get punished for their, getting punished for externalities no, no, no. is one thing. I mean, we have we have drunken public laws, drunk driving laws. I mean, we'll have the same laws for drug use, you know. But that doesn't mean that the drug itself has to be illegal, and that you tell me what I can put in my body. And there's also externalities. Those are those are different being things. So incompetent that they find they go to the wrong house on a drug raid and kick the door and yeah. kill somebody. That's, that's a totally separate. That's a holy externality. But the, no. but there's also externalities to meth usage, to, to to cocaine usage, to crack usage. Look at some right. of the areas in the Bronx. You don't think yeah, that's an externality? Back to it gets said. better if you leave. Well, a lot of no. It's a cost. Benefit. Right, but ninety percent. 90% of the what, negative right? externalities of drugs have to do with prohibition and not use. Okay. All right. So it's, it's prohibition that causes 90% of the problems. And the that's negative, only the because negative, it's illegal. Right. 
The negative externalities of drug usage are prohibition's fault. I got you. That's because we, pro we so people that the negative effects of drug usage happen from prohibition. People use the drugs whether they're pro prohibited or not. Doesn't matter, right? I'm not talking well, about the prohibition. I'm saying there's negative. Ex Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, let's get Michael in here. I, I mean, your your original your original point and what you actually start out with was, you know, the government is doing this and that. They're invading our lives. They're lawless, and people are talking about pot. And what's the big deal about pot? Well, I, I think it, one of the reasons that it's a big deal, and I think this is especially true for conservatives and Republicans, is this issue is a way to make inroads with the inner city and the youth and to actually start stealing votes away from no. Democrats that they haven't been able to get. If they start no, talking about this is issue. Do that. School choice is a better way to do that. Why don't we focus on positive things other than people using drugs? How about school choice? Well, How about minimum wage well, laws? Why are we focused on pot? I don't, I don't get it. It's like, oh, I want to, I have self-ownership. First of all, philosophically, the people, the underpinnings of this country were never on self-ownership. De Tocqueville talked about it. Locke talked about it. You do not have self-ownership. You have the right to liberty, which is the liberty to flourish. That's, he didn't say well, you have the right to kill yourself. You do not have a right to self-ownership. The, the same place where the, the metaphysical laws of life, liberty, and property come from, come from the same place as, as, as this mythical, where you're calling a right to self-ownership, which does not exist. The underpinnings of liberty are not self-ownership. So you don't own your body? Someone else owns your body? No, you do not. No, you do not own your body. Do you want to talk about life? You don't where own where does life, liberty, where do the, so the, where do the metaphysical? No, no one owns your, you do not own your body, nor does the government. Where do the rights, life, liberty, and property come from? Where do they stem from? Well, hey, what does it say in the I, Declaration I of Independence? Point, well, it's, a, it's simple. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, the, no, if, if you let me finish, all right, let me talk here for a second. Okay, the reason this is a big deal, all right, you're a conservative, you know, kids no, that grow up in fatherless homes. I'm not a Will, I, hey, I, Will, it's not can that I I'm talk? A conservative. Hey. I'm all about... You're misconstruing my argument here. I'm all about legalizing, whoa, whoa, whoa. decriminalizing. Let Mike, let Mike finish. Let Mike finish. I, 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 right. can't, I can't get my point out when you only give me three words, Will. All right, look. You're a conservative. You know there's big no. issues when no. kids grow up in fatherless homes. Okay. If you have this but drug war and you're saying, hey, you're saying, hey, school of choice is a bigger deal in the inner city. Other things are, are disproportionately in the inner city. This law affects more African Americans and more inner city youth than any other law we have right now. Uh, you know, kids are Mar growing up in homes due to does? the law is affecting the drugs. Mandatory minimum okay. sentencing. Kids are growing up right. in fatherless homes. It's destroying the inner cities. And, and that's from you marijuana? have a chance here from, from the drug you, war in general, like but can... yes, marijuana. Okay, so you're not you won't link it to you you're not you're not willing to link it to the Great Society then. It wasn't the Great Society, it was just a drug war. The drug war, yeah, the drug war in general has been has been okay, a, so, a burden on 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 our inner cities. Okay. And this would, this is my main point. With, the reason I think it's a big deal, Will, is because you have a chance here on the right to steal votes because we're not going to win elections anymore because we can't no, get these wanna, these modern people. There's no there's not an, it's not a big issue to people is the drug war. You're not going to go out in the street and say, what's a big issue to you? And they're going to go, oh, the drug war. That's tyranny. Absolutely not. That's not going to happen. I can, have you, have no, you, what I can... Have you ever been to downtown Detroit? Among younger voters, the drug war is a very big issue. Is, you don't think it's this not is a big, big issue, issue to people in downtown vote. Detroit? You're insane if you think that's a big issue and that that matters in this election. If you're, That's insanity to think that that matters and that the drug war matters. If you look at a poll, 32% of people say it's jobs and the economy. So first of all, capitalism oh, yeah. is what matters. If, if you're, if you're right. asking me what's the biggest issue, no, Climate I don't think the drug war is the biggest issue. Okay, it's, it's issue. irrelevant. Okay, my point is it's irrelevant. In it. I don't, I'm not saying to me it's irrelevant. I'm saying within this election cycle, it's entirely irrelevant. It means little. No one's going to the economy polls. Economy may be on the, the drug biggest war. issue, but there are single issue voters for every issue, and there are plenty of people sure, whose single issue is going to be, is be ending the drug war. There's single issue this voters is that, would, that prefer communism. There's communists out there. That doesn't mean they're going to sway the election. I'm not talking about single issue voters. I mean, what are you rolling your eyes? Of the Colorado, Colorado is a swing campaign. state. Colorado is going to be a cornerstone of Rand Paul's campaign. Votes. You, so do you think they're turning out to vote for pot because they legalized it in their state? How do you draw that correlation? Do you have any facts to back that up? How do you not draw that correlation? 
Okay, Carl so then you don't state. have it. They back. just let's move along. Yes, because they Do legalized pot. That, that it's not. I, I mean, it seems like a know. reasonable thing. So to your point, the president should come out and say, "I want a wholesale legalization of pot," and they're going to win. I don't know why they haven't done it yet. They should do it now. I, I agree. That's what I would do. I'd come out and say, let's legalize pot. I, I win. And drop the mic and walk off the stage. What do you... <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. It's a I it's, it's, it's it's one issue well. among many, but it's, it's still an important issue. Well, he said it's a swing state. So in order to win, just say I'm for the legalization of pot. Or should they say perhaps, geez, I'm for the Tenth Amendment. I'm for federalism. I'd allow the states to uh, to, to decide what happens. That's Rand Paul. I think that's position. both. With, that's Ted Cruz's position as well. They just have the same position. Bullshit. Not on. Not okay, on you're pot. right. You're right. You're right. That's not what Ted Cruz said. You're right. I, I don't know. All right, let's move along. Ted Cruz is super hypocritical about the whole states' rights. All right, thing. he's he's not pure enough for you either, Grant. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the Tenth Amendment's not pure enough either. Go, go ahead. Why don't we start with tell me how I'm wrong? Well, Somebody. Um, Who are you talking to? I, I, mean, I, I think. Yeah. Anyway, what's yeah, your I, question? I think, all right, all right, well, shut up for a second. I, I think. I, I think if we narrow the drug war down to just marijuana laws, that has been arguably the most rapidly changing law across the entire country in the last ten years. More. I mean, really, since Prop Six was it Prop 16 or whatever in California first started. Uh, uh, so I think, from a way, it resonates with the voters. I, I think if you're going to stand in front of a voter and start talking about federalism, they're just going to like give you blank stares. Whereas if you're talking about an issue that's been on the headlines consistently for the last five to ten years, it's probably going to make a little bit more of a of a of a announcement to them. And well, you're always talking about balanced budget. Talk about saving. How many billions of dollars in, t in taxes and in generating even more tax revenue for a treasury that, let's be honest, our, our fiscal outlook is not very pretty with the pending I'm, social security. You're missing my argument. My, no, no, you missed I, my I, argument. I see what you're saying. I, see what you, I, I understand what you're saying, but the counter to that is that marijuana laws has certainly been, in the last 10 years, okay. that and gay I'm marriage not, have been the two things that have been sweeping. So no matter whether you like it or not, Will, candidates are going to focus on that because that has been No, no they're not. I guarantee you. I guarantee they're not you, focusing on it now. Are going to bring up gay marriage and abortion, and Rand Paul is going to stick to states' rights, uh, and he's going to talk about the drug war, right. and he's going to talk about – That's not – Yeah, I, I guarantee you. That's he's going to talk about – Yeah. Are you kidding me? He put the Redeem Act through Congress. Oh, yeah. so I, all right. Grant, well, I'm going to – Let me narrow your argument. Hold on, Mike. Mike, I'm going to narrow his argument down, then I'll get to you. So you're saying this election cycle is on gay marriage and pot. That's what you're saying. No, that this is what the voters want. It's going to be two of the front big issues. Okay, so that, you just that agree with me. Politicians are going to be okay. used against each other. Hold, I'm not saying they're the most important issues, but I'm saying that the people okay. in the elections will be using those either. They're going to use anything. In their own They'll use anything against each other. They're going to be, oh, I'm not disagreeing. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm saying this election cycle is not built on gay marriage and pot. That's my argument. That is my argument wholesale right there. You agree? That's what I'm saying. That's that's my I, point. Yeah. I think it that's what I'm trying to nail down. That, and I, I think it's going to be built. Like, I think there's going to be a lot of like domestic uh, civil liberties issues as far as like the NSA goes. But I guarantee you, those two issues are going to be slung around in the political crapshoot. There, uh, no, there is no. They've been slung around for years, no doubt about it. That is right. not what this election cycle is going to be about. Uh, that's just well, not that's what, what it's going to be it about. <laughs> I, who? Who's they? Whoever, whoever you're, primaries, you're fighting. Uh, I mean, in the oh, general, go, like, Mike. Uh, Mike go. <laughs> give Mike, give Mike a chance here. You're arguing with yourself, Will. You said at the beginning of the segment that. We have all these issues going on. We have all these issues, and everybody's talking about pot. And now you're saying nobody's talking about pot. It's not a big deal no, 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 no. in this election. No, Mike, I, opened, I said libertarian purists are talking about it, and it's a non-issue. That's my point. Libertarian I purists. Not, I, don't, I don't get how it's a non-issue because Rand Paul made this a point in his, his first speech as a candidate. Rand Paul talked about point, how any law point, that's disproportionately affecting African Americans needs to be repealed. Do you think what, what law do you think Rand Paul was talking about? What, no, why no, do you no, think no. Rand Paul is opening? 
Republican no, no, no. outreach in inner cities. It's not Rand Paul. I'm not talking about. I'm talking about libertarian purists that don't want to vote for Rand Paul because of the drug war or libertarian issues they're unwilling to give up. That's what I'm. I'm not talking about what Rand Paul said. I'm not arguing against Rand Paul. I'm a huge supporter of Rand Paul. Again, I disagree with the drug war on a cost-benefit analysis. That is not my argument. I, my argument is that's not what the election is about. So libertarian purists out there are concerned about pot while the republic's falling to pieces. This is what I'm talking about. That's my so argument. Your, so your, what your basic you point is that – Or should be forefront. Two issues. The, con the, con the, the number one issue is the Constitution. It's not being followed. That's the number one issue. I don't care about any well, singular issue. Care I care about, about the rule. Exactly. I, I don't know. I'm just saying the Constitution should be adhered to. I agree, with you, well, I agree to. with you that the usurping of executive power and the abuse Con of the Congress does it. Should be in judiciary. Issue, but in the right. political garbage shoot, it's not going to be. No, it, it's going to be. Unfortunately. In my view, and I could be wrong, I think that Cruz or, or Rand Paul are going to espouse constitutional principles, and ultimately I think that's what wins in the end. Both have done the same. They differ slightly on some policy issues, but both espouse the rule of law and the Constitution. And what, I think what it gets down to is a lot of libertarian purists despise the Constitution. Would you agree, Jay? They despise the Constitution? I don't Constitution. think they like the rule uh, of law. I wouldn't say despise, but libertarians... Libertarians, well, not the, I wouldn't say the rule of law. I'd say they're in favor of the rule of law, but they, most people believe, most libertarians would say, you know, an unjust law is no law at all. Yeah. You know, the war on drugs is not a just law. It's not a law. Right. Is Congress bypass, is, is the president bypassing Congress okay? Why isn't that on the forefront? That's, that's blatant tyranny and despotism. Why is that not on the forefront? I completely agree. I don't, well, but I, I don't well, understand. You, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, I, he's been doing it for he's been doing it for seven years now, he's, or six years now. So I mean, it's kind of one of those things that it's just like, yeah, well, Obama goes around Congress. Uh, you know, the sky's blue. You know, it's been happening for six years. People are kind of uh, getting over it. Well, it's been happening now. longer it's than been six happening years. A lot more We're not getting over it, but they're, they're just they're accustomed George Bush, to it. George W. You know, they're like, well, there's nothing we George can do. W. Bush has done it. They've all done it. I I, I just want to know really, what at what really point since, people they all do it. Yeah. Since FDR confiscated, or well, since the confiscation of all the gold, in George the Bush States, did it. That's the only, that's the F one of the F big important reasons of the, you know. Of, you know, Hold voting on, for time. Rand Paul is someone that actually believes in the Constitution. Hold on, one sec. Give Grant. Go ahead, Grant. Uh, I, I mean, uh, people keep bringing this up. I can't see. And Grant. I don't know if it's, can't if it's, it's. I mean, Republicans are using it, using it Sorry. as political yeah. capital. Uh, libertarians have, are always pointing this out, but but what it comes down to is that uh, uh, executive orders has just kind of been a thing for the last I don't know, uh, fifty years, sixty years. Of presidency, it's this is not like a new problem. This is for a long time been a problem, and uh, I'm not I'm not really as familiar with constitutional law as maybe you are, Will, or, or you guys are. But I, is there a strict provision for executive orders in the Constitution? I, I don't. I mean, I'm not. No sure, executive I orders. Like I'm going to get the mic, but a little brief a history and executive orders. Those are just how the executive, uh, the president executes law within his own department. Let's say he can write an executive order on, I don't know, how many pens to use within the executive branch, how to interpret or how to enforce a law is what he would write it. You cannot use an executive order to write law. Um, but that's just one of the problems. You also have the EPA. You have this thing with the FCC. They just all of a sudden, they, 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 they reschedule uh, the Internet as a utility. Where, where do you get the authority to do that? That's insane. You have the judiciary. They gave themselves the authority. It, that's right. They don't have it. They didn't get it from. They did. Did they derive it from the people? No. That's tyranny, is it not? How do you just tell us what's a utility? Absolutely. That's not their job. Um, Mike. Uh, yeah. That's that's on executive orders. But you have the administrative state. The EPA writes laws. The IRS. Look what they do. That's insane. Uh, go ahead, Mike. I know you want well, to get I, in I here. I think everybody agrees with you, Will. I, I, I. My only thing is, I guess, if your point is, if you're trying to get libertarian purist. To care about the rule of you know, law as derived from the Constitution, well, why, I don't think they're going to care about that. And frankly, why yeah, should we? Why why should we wish they would care? They're like what one percent of the electorate. Let them let them let them no, stew about right. anarchy if they want to. 
You're right, but let me ask you this, Michael, and you probably have the same qualm. They claim the cl that they claim the mantle of classical liberalism, but know nothing about it. Have they read Locke? Do they know Montesquieu? Um, have they read Hume? Do they, I don't understand where they derive their, li their libertarian or classical liberal principles from. Um, they care just about, it seems to me they care about pot, the drug war. What was the other thing? What do you guys know? There's another thing that they hate Rand Paul about. Um, I, I don't know policy. specifically what it was. Foreign po Yeah, foreign, foreign policy. policy. Um, yeah, he's not pure enough on foreign policy. And there was another issue that I can't, I should have wrote it down. That's, um, the, that's the biggest gay marriage. thing. I, I just can't believe it. It's like he's just as libertarian as Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson right. wanted to go into Uganda to fight the Lord's Resistance Army. I mean, I love Gary Johnson and I voted for him, but he is no more libertarian on foreign policy than Rand Paul is. But no right. one seems to, to understand that. They, they're always saying, oh, we should you know support Gary Johnson because Rand's a, you know, a neocon, he's a warmonger. But couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, he's by far the most libertarian, you know, on on, on uh, foreign policy. He's just as libertarian as any libertarian party candidate. Right. Let me and and let me ask you this: and you're you're engaged with these guys, Jay. Do you think they do their homework? Do you think it's just it's hearsay, or are they following some luminary yes. like Tom Woods or something? Where are they getting this stuff from? Rothbard. The Libertarian Party Facebook page, probably. I don't know. <laughs> just, just the LP Other platform. Other smear attacks. Just, it's an echo chamber. You know, the, the, there's a. I found a group the other day called Libertarians in Name Only, where they call out pe or people who they say are, you know, Libertarians in name, like Republican in Name Only. So I mean, they call out these uh, these people who aren't pure enough for them, and it's just like. It's just an echo chamber of oh, they're not pure, and then someone else hears them saying that they're not pure and it just spirals and uh, one of the when I I wrote about Rand Paul's uh, announcement yesterday and someone commented saying that Rand Paul's you know anti-drug and anti-gay and anti-abortion uh, anti like all these things and they were wrong on like every single one of the issues they were misinformed on every single one of the issues they're just listening to other libertarians so I spelled right. out each one of the things and you know, no response, of course, but I mean, they didn't know Rand's position on any one of the issues. Right. They're just assuming. So is the echo chamber, let me, one one more question, I'm going to get the mic. Is the echo chamber largely in social media? Yeah, libertarians are so spread out, I can't imagine they're actually meeting each other in real life. Right. I mean, our living together is a freaky coincidence. <laughs> I know, right? Our living near each other. <laughs> Okay, and let me and let me get to Michael. What do you? I mean, we deal with these guys a lot on our pages, but where do you think it's just a, uh, this dogmatic adherence to uh, Roth to maybe perhaps a Rothbard type or a, or a Woods type? Where do you think where do you think they get this from, and why do you think it, they're so it, every politician or I don't know that these their principles are so anathema to our government? Where do they get that from, Mike? In your view. I think maybe part of the problem is that, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of the libertarian movement cropped up because of Ron Paul. Ron Paul put li the libertarian movement on the map. And Ron Paul was a very un uncompromising politician. You know, he wouldn't budge on almost anything. You know, he maybe changed a little bit over the years, you know, but it was a long career. So now libertarians have this kind of picture in their head of you can't compromise on anything at all. That that's what they came up with in the movement with was a guy like Ron Paul who he wasn't going to budge on anything and now you have to be pure like Ron Paul right. was to them otherwise you're not good enough and even Rand Paul right. who is probably 95% compatible on positions with Ron Paul is a neocon who's unelectable to them that that's that's a, right. to me that's just crazy and and to my point before Mike was there are some things you should not compromise on like axiomatic rights are not things you compromise on, certain things that are written Absolutely. to the rule of law are things you do not compromise on. But certain yeah, exactly. issues right. are things that you have no choice. Policy debates, the Madisonian dilemma, that right between self-government and individual rights are things that must at times be compromised on. Um, but I think we're so far, we, our constitution is so far in the breach that I think just making even little incremental movements towards it is a huge plus. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't think electing the president is the end-all, be-all. It's one step in the movement. I think the states need to take a little bit back as well. 
Um, Grant, to that point, um, do you think that they just pay, they pay lip service to these libertarian principles and then when the time comes that they go and they vote? Or do you think that they really, they really adhere to what they say, that, they're, that, that, you know, that it's not just lip service, it's actual, it, it promulgates itself in action as well? Well, whenever I see these purist libertarians on the internet, and every now and then I'll entertain one with a debate, I, they always say that, you know, Rand Paul's a statist. But I think, you know, <laughs> you know, Obama was sort of the Trojan horse socialist, right? He came in as this moderate, uh, uh, save us from the, from the Bush administration, and then ended up being a full-blown socialist. I mean, anyone with two eyes can see that that was exactly what he was doing. So I think Rand Paul is sort of the, the Trojan horse libertarian. Uh, I don't think he'll be the libertarian purist in that sense of it, but I, I think he's going to be a lot more libertarian-minded than people give him credit for. Like, I, I, I just, uh, earlier today, I saw Gary Johnson share a link about Rand Paul's uh, uh, campaign being off to a rocky start, and it was an MSNBC link, and I was like, when Gary Johnson is sharing MSNBC, you know shit is going crazy. Right. Um, so so I, I think that that's what's happening, is uh, people are uh, assuming he's a politician that's going to sell it, that's selling a message that's going to turn the wrong way, when I think he's going to take even more steps in the right direction. And I mean, you got to give him credit. Uh, uh, he, he's... Um, he put on the suit, he did up the hair, and I met Ron Paul a few times, and I'm surprised that he even got the following he did, because honestly, he's uh, uh, not very well put together. He's, frankly, he seems kind of like senile when you talk to him in person, and, and, and he's and he's a smart guy, and he communicates well, but but Rand is much more articulate, and I think well-spoken to that degree. Um, I agree. And, and I think that will make him ultimately much more Rand. electable. Yeah, Go ahead. the thing with, the, with Rand that, that none of the purists seem to understand. It's like he could easily be a Trojan horse, but they'd rather be pessimistic and think, oh, he's a Trojan horse and he's really a neocon pretending to be a libertarian instead of being optimistic and thinking he's a libertarian pretending to be a little bit conservative just to get through Iowa, which is going to be tough because they're, they're a bunch of kooks. So, you know, they're, they're going to vote for their ethanol subsidies and probably, you know, I don't know if Bush will win, but maybe Huckabee or another, another, big government status to win, but Ron you know, I'd rather be optimistic about son. the fact that Ron Paul's yeah, son is yeah. running, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I'd rather be optimistic about that instead I'm of be, pessimistic like all the other purists. It's going to be curious, I'm going to be curious to see how Rand and uh, Cruz do in Iowa that they, that now that I mean, Rand gave paid lip service against, uh, against the corn subsidy or ethanol subsidies, but Cruz flat out rejected it. So I'm going to be curious to see what happens in Iowa. I think both of them, I don't, I mean, there's a, there's actually a younger, do you think there's a younger contingency there in Iowa, Mike? I mean, you would know this, uh, but I don't know if the younger crowd would vote for, say, a Cruz, but they might for Rand. So I think it might hurt, in Iowa, Cruz might get hurt more. What do you think? There's not, there's not a really younger contingency in the heartland, I don't think. I mean, a, a lot of the heartland, these were people that were having 12 kids, you know, at a time for their farms, and that's, Agriculture is, has dipped low in the recent years, so I don't think there's a youth movement that's going to be happening in Iowa or Nebraska anytime soon. Ron, Ron Paul got a lot of the youth to turn out for the caucuses, right? Yeah, he did. He almost won Iowa last time, but I don't even that wasn't even really the youth. He just he really concentrated on Iowa. He did really well there, and if if that caucus was held maybe a week earlier, he probably would have won it. Yeah, he he was he was and he came close somewhere else. Was it New Hampshire? I don't remember. I can't remember. Oh. So, was it Maine? Well too in long, man. But yeah, it's been too long. He almost won Maine. It was Nevada. Yeah, it was I up there. Actually, he, he almost won Nevada. Down, but they, they... Okay. And yeah, Nevada. But okay, they, so they now... screwed up. The... I'm sorry. Um, I just want to move along to the real threat here, which is the, the most hated. I think for me, and the lib like like Mike said, the libertarian purists really don't matter. They could matter if they, you know, I don't know if they're a bit more pragmatic about their ideological proclivities. They could matter in a primary process, but I, I just think they render themselves uh, useless, like Mike said. But the real problem here is the GOP establishment, the people with the money. Most importantly, it's like the Bush family. Um, I, I mean, they've already attacked Rand Paul. They've been attacking Cruz since he started, since he announced. Um, but I mean, they have like talking heads on news programs. Um, 
this is my question, and I'm going to go to Jay with this one. Do you think Rand Paul stands a chance against the GOP establishment? You already have Lindsey Graham attacking him, who has no chance to win. But I think literally said on television that my job is to come in and I'm going – I think he's literally said is to go after Rand Paul. Yeah. I think I, – yeah, I could be wrong, but I mean here he is. He's left. Go ahead. Yeah, I, hold on. Let me just tell I, I people know, that he's, I know the he's talking about. They're they're asking they're asking why he's running, and he's saying he said like uh, they were talking about Rand Paul previously, and they asked Lindsey Graham like why he's running. He's like, well, I I need to you know have my foreign policy views, and you know America's in danger, and all that stuff. You know, it's like God, I should imagine like Lindsey Graham hiding under the bed every night, you know, with the lights on. Like, right. <laughs> God, the guy's you... scared of his own shadow. He said um, that, but no, came there's out, no chance at all. But I, I'm much more concerned about the hundreds of millions of dollars that you know Sharon Adelson is going to throw against Rand Paul and all the other big mega donors, Tom, Tom uh, Stoddard, all the neocons that you know, yeah, yeah. And all all the big billionaires uh, are going to be for Bush because they want their corporate welfare the after he, if he gets elected. All corporatists, every one of them. Not cap, not a Bush is not a capitalist. Nowhere near a capitalist. This is the problem, and I think that's where the this dichotomy comes into. It's a, the, real, literally the fascists and, and the capitalists. I mean, maybe it's maybe I'm a little crazy, but that's to me that's what it is. You have this fascist Bush family who's always been that way, and then you have your capitalists who are uh, 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 Cruz and Paul, and they're going to nail these guys. And you already saw an ad. It was American Center for friggin' progress and Carl Rovian strategies, or whatever the hell it was called. I don't know if you saw it, Mike, but it was like, uh, yeah, you know, so without a... Yeah, like a big, big, fat white guys owned by yeah. the military-industrial complex, so, you know, yeah. But, it, but literally, its claim was, was that he's to, the, he's to the left of Obama um, on foreign policy. Iran's going to basically, what they're saying, Iran will get a nuke if you elect Rand Paul. I mean, this is... It's insane. And then and they I end with a mushroom cloud. Yeah. <laughs> the end of like that. that. It's a mushroom cloud. <laughs> it was aching to like, I mean, look, they've done, they did this to Barry Goldwater. I mean, I went through the old, I went through all these old campaigns and they did this to Barry Goldwater. Um, I don't know if oh. you remember that Daisy commercial. Like if Barry Goldwater's elected, yeah, you're yeah. like guaranteed to get yeah, war. Yeah, yeah. And they had the, you know, and then they did this to Reagan twice in 76. They went after this guy. It was insane. And then, um, and now you have it. You're going to see this with there's Rand Paul. There's a lot of money in war. It, there's, there's a there's lot a, of money in war. There's Bombs a lot of money. Great. In, you own. They're really expensive, and you only use them once. I mean, there's a lot of money in selling. A lot of money in politics. The, selling bombs to the government is a great business to be in. Mike, you know, if you, you're Jeb Bush, if you have Jeb Bush as president, or, or Obama, or, or Clinton as president, you know. Let me get Mike in here. Mike, do you think Rand Paul stands a chance against the lashing he's going to get? Uh, from the GOP establishment. And mind you, not only do they have the money, they have the resources in the media and so on and so forth. What do you think? That's a tough question because I think Rand Paul has the most, maybe one of the more pragmatic stances on foreign policy I've ever seen. Uh, you know, you got the liberals that are all about, you know, peace no matter what, and you got a lot of the Ron Paul people who are, you know, peace no matter what, withdrawal their the U.S. military from around the world. And then you got the neocons over here that want to go to war with anybody that sneezes. And then you got Rand Paul who says, you know, hey, Iran could be a threat. You know, these sanctions are at least working to bring them to the table. You know, he knows that we need a robust military presence around the world to stabilize uh, to stabilize things and, and serve our interests. So I think Rand Paul has maybe one of the most pragmatic foreign policy uh, positions that I've ever seen in modern American politics. But does that stand a chance? It stands a chance with the voter, I think. I think the voter will really be receptive of that. But with the big money and the media and the way they're going to paint them, especially in a Republican primary, that's going to be a big problem. Because the way the Republican media, the conservative media works, and the way the big money in the Republican, the way the big money in the Republican Party goes, having any sort of pragmatic stance on foreign policy is going to be a big time problem for Rand Paul. Yeah, I I agree. I don't. It doesn't matter how prag, Paul. right? It doesn't. It doesn't matter how no, pragmatic his foreign policy is. They're going to chew this guy up either way. They're going to make make things up, and 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 and, yeah. and it's not the foreign policy that Just bothers like them. With, with Ron Paul, do you remember all right. the people that were calling Ron Paul an isolationist instead of a non-interventionist? On well, purpose, Ron, they knew Ron the difference Paul, of the Ron. words, but they would Ron, call him an isolationist. They're going to do the Paul's exact same policy. thing to Rand. 
Ron Paul's foreign policy is way easier to attack than Rand Paul's. I mean, Rand, it's, that's at, that's no, what I, I agree. Question. But I mean, they're going to, I agree. But at that point, doesn't matter what the, what his, what Rand Paul, they're going to attack him on that. And I think what they really need to stick to, like we said, is economy and jobs. Let them go off about this. This is what they're concerned about is that corporatist element that these big donors that are giving to Jeb Bush are worried about that they're not going to be able to get anything out of these guys. So they need to appeal to the people. They need to appeal to capitalism, markets, free trade. What do you think, um, Grant? What do you think would be a selling point? I mean, I, I, I saw these. I saw the polls yesterday. 32% of people are concerned about the economy and jobs. Do you think it is more advantageous for Rand Paul to worry more so? I mean, obviously rebut some of these claims, these ridiculous claims on foreign policy. But do you think it's more important for him to stick to the economy, free market capitalism, and for once have a politician that espouses the free market and can speak eloquently about it? What do you think? Well, I think Rand Paul has already jumped on that. I mean, look at his campaign slogan, in the Washington machine and unleash the American dream. Like, he, he obviously knows that people are going to attack his foreign policy. So he's going to have to stay, stick to his guns as far as uh, the economy and jobs go. Uh, I think our recovery has been dismal. I think uh, Obamacare is going to just make it even worse. Uh, um, and, and he, and I think Ted Cruz also noted uh, about having people opt out of Social Security, which I think would be a great boost for the economy. Uh, so I think Rand Paul is that. well aware of the attacks coming on him from foreign policy because, frankly, they've been coming at him already since he was well before he was declared to be a, a presidential candidate. And, and really, when he first took onto the scene, I, I think when ISIS came on and the whole Syria chemical weapons thing it is really when the GOP establishment and even the sort of the so-called anti-war left started going after Rand Paul. Um, and that, I, I think, is his, he's got good campaign managers in place, and I think that he's, he's well aware of who, where they're going to come at him from. But I think that Rand Paul has probably, arguably, the biggest grassroots support and grassroots campaign in modern American politics. Uh, I mean... Maybe Barack By Obama far. in 2008 would have him beat, but I think in that situation that Obama sort of was gifted uh, is entirely different than what Rand Paul faces now. I mean, Obama was gifted at the end of two freaking horrible wars and, and a recession and all this horrible right. things that were going on. I mean, anyone could have walked in and been like, like me, I'm from the other party. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I think Rand Paul has the best grassroots campaign in modern American politics, and I think that's going to play to the strength. Right. Um, That's definitely going to help think. in Iowa, New Hampshire, and all the early let, primaries. Let me get Jay. Let me get to Mike here, and then I'm going to get to you with the same question. Okay. Um, let me let me get you in order, Mike. What do you think Rand should focus on? What's his strong point in order to get the focus off whatever the GOP establishment is going to throw at the guy? Because they're going to throw everything at him. This little puke Lindsey Graham. I could hit. I like if I see that guy, I'll punch him in his face. I so I should, probably shouldn't have said that, but. I can't stand that guy. What do you think? The, I mean, he's literally going to run a campaign to go after Rand Paul. So what do you think it, it should be his strategy? Should he stick to the economy or should he, do you think he should more, he should better elucidate his stance on foreign policy? I, you know, I don't think he, I think he should make his stance on foreign policy clear, but I don't think he should focus on that. I think he should deflect that a little bit. The main thing that I think Rand Paul should focus on, and the economy is a good one too, and free market economics is, is a good thing for him to stick to. But I really think what Rand Paul should stick to is fiscal responsibility. He's got pretty much any candidate in the Republican field. Uh, he's far ahead of all of them in this area. You know, he's he's introduced a balanced budget amendment. He's voted against almost any irresponsible spending. And he's, he's even got Cruz beat here because the story that the media has completely painted a false narrative on this story, saying that Rand Paul supports a $192 billion increase in defense spending, well, what happened was Ted Cruz and, and Rubio introduced legislation or raised defense spending. Rand Paul wanted them on record as saying that, hey, uh, if you're going to raise defense spending, you at least have to offset that with some cuts to domestic spending. So he introduced an amendment that gave them the defense spending they wanted offset by domestic cuts. And, of course, Rubio and Cruz voted against that bill. And he used that to show, hey, look, I'm the only one that's willing to actually make sacrifices here. You know, Cruz is great. But I know that you got to cut the sacred cow on both sides of the aisle. So I think that's an issue that Rand Paul, I mean, conservatives are really worried about this issue. They've been worried about it since 2012. 
and now they're really worried about it because it hasn't changed at all. And Rand Paul's got any, every candidate beat on this issue. Now, just to be fair, though, on that passing of the defense budget, no, no Democrat's going to vote for it if you pull if you pull funding from something else. So that's oh, no, the reason just, why they didn't. He just vote. wanted. He just wanted Cruz and Rubio on record. That's right. all he wanted. Right. It was a political no, move. No doubt. It was a right. Yeah, political move. All right. Um, a shrewd one. Good for him. Exactly. I, that's. Um, J Jay, uh, Jay, did you hear the question I asked Mike, or do you want me to say it again? Can you hear me? Mike, can I was saying it's it was part of the Senate well, vote yeah, around. You know what, let me tailor it to you more specifically. Because, because, you know. um, what do you think Rand should focus on that will appeal to, say, the purest base and everybody else? And in my opinion, that's focusing on capitalism. Um, would you agree, or do you think there's another issue? I, th I agree with Mike. He should clarify his stance on foreign policy. I want to hear him come out and say something about the RIFRA law. I'd like to hear that. But what do you think? What, what do you think he should focus on that would appeal uh, to the broad spectrum of voters, and perhaps maybe get some of those purists on board at the same time, which would be very difficult. The good thing about Ron Paul, and, or sorry, Rand Paul, and what um, what separates him from all the other candidates is they only have one issue to run on, or a couple issues. I mean, they, they like Ted Cruz, uh, how Rand Paul always says, he just throws the red meat out to the base. Uh, you know, where, whereas Rand Paul has um, sentencing reform to go after the African-American vote. Rand Paul has privacy rights uh, and the NSA stuff to go after the college, um, college age young voters. Rand Paul has lots of issues to go after lots of different segments. So I wouldn't say he really needs to focus on one or the other because his strategy so far is to spread out and go after lots of different groups. And that's why he has the support that he does. It's not because he goes, he focuses on one issue or focuses on another okay. issue. He has lots of different issues. And one of the things he said, uh, if you watch the Hannity interview, was he was saying that, you know, uh, Republicans need to be for the entire Bill of Rights, not just the Second Amendment. So that's where I think is his strength. He'll go after multiple different issues and get lots of little niche groups and build a coalition that'll okay. win. Um, good answer. Yeah, I like that. Um, let me think. I want to go to a question. There's a good question here. And um, I'll go to Grant first. Can you guys see the can question? At the <laughs> Jay, can you see that question up there? It's on the top of the screen. OK. Um, yeah. I'll read it out. What are your thoughts on a balanced budget law for the federal government? Should there be exceptions to this kind of law, recessions, disasters? Do you think it will affect government's ability to respond to recessions, or do you think monetary policy or something else will? I think that's a great question. I can na I'll nail that question, but Grant, I want you to hit it. I'll go to Mike and to Jay. Go ahead, Grant. Okay, so um, what I believe is that the, the federal government should never run a deficit at all. Uh, and the reason is because once they start to run deficits, they don't stop. And, and as far as monetary policy goes, within within the context of recessions and, and uh, depressions or whatever you want to call them, uh, I, I tend to agree with Milt Friedman when basically what he said was the Federal Reserve should every year do the same thing, expand the monetary base by, I think it was 2 to 6%, maybe 3 to 5. Three I don't to, remember three exactly. 3 to 5. Three to five. Three to five. All right. Well, yeah. and, and that might not be ideal for the economic conditions at hand, but at least it's predictable. So it, it, no matter what business you're in, no, no, whether it's financial markets or you're in construction or, or whatever, that would have a serious interest in monetary policy uh, and be following it closely. You might not be excited with what they're going to do in, in a recession, but at least you know what they're going to do. Where right yeah. now it's just kind of like everyone's holding on to their pants thinking, oh shit, is the Fed going to continue quantitative easing into the next quarter? Uh, are they going to change the interest rate? And the second they do, it's kind of like hold on to your hats and hope you don't lose your lose everything. Uh, uh, but as far as you know, directly, it's something else of potential potential fall offset aggregate demand. I don't think the government really has a place in, in, in stimulating aggregate demand. There's a lot of people who think uh, that the military spending is a great way to like stimulate the economy. I think that's a terrible idea because it, it kind of insinuates that that spending wouldn't happen in the first place or that that money wouldn't be better saved and then loaned out by financial intermediaries that probably have a better idea of how to allocate capital. 
Um, so I think in general, relying on the federal government to manage the trend of the economy, whether it's through the Federal Reserve or through government spending, is just going to end up being catastrophic at some point. Whether it's tomorrow or 50 years down the road, it's just not going to work. And, and that's, right. I think that's where we are now. Right. Um, Mike, I know you'll nail this one. What do you think about this? Um, and I, specifically, can you handle the question of should, the, uh, should you know, on the balanced budget amendment, should there be exceptions to this kind of law? Go, go ahead. Yeah, I actually, uh, I had a chance to talk to Justin Amash about his balanced budget amendment that he introduced a couple of years ago. And I, uh, what he said was, uh, and I agree with him, is that there should be exceptions to the balanced budget amendment. And uh, one of the specific examples that he brought up is in time of national crisis, whether that be a natural disaster or a large scale war. Uh, if you can't, if you can't take out, if you, you know, can't take on some debt to fight a war, uh, most of the time you're not going to win. And if it's a large war, you know, think about World War II. If we wouldn't have been able to take, if we wouldn't have been able to lend out money and take on debt during World War II, we wouldn't have won that war. The reason we won that war was because of how much money and, and, and superior manufacturing power, but you had to spend money to do it. So I think, yeah, there should be exceptions, but built into his balanced budget amendment was ways to uh, decrease spending quickly within the next decade to bring the budget back to where pre-war levels. And I think that's important. Uh, once the war is over, you have to decrease the spending. I think Grant brought up a good point that governments tend to continue spending once once you give them the chance to. And and that's that's a great point. But they actually didn't after World War II. Uh, debt levels came way down. Uh, there were some of the Roosevelt era policies that, that continued. But, you know, debt levels came way down after World War II. But when you look at this war, debt levels continue to rise even as the drawdown of the war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq has happened. So, you know, you have to you have to have that in there, a, a, a time frame. But on the other question, uh, you know, I don't think the, the government has a role to play in stimulating aggregate demand or ending recessions, especially when it comes to fiscal stimulus. Fiscal stimulus has been shown to be completely ineffective. It's the, alloc the resources aren't allocated well anyway. So why would you need to take on debt for fiscal stimulus? Uh, monetary stimulus is is superior to fiscal stimulus. I don't necessarily support it, but you could still have monetary stimulus if you really needed to and a balanced budget amendment at the same time. Good answer. I like that. I know that point on the point on war was spot on. I mean, that, uh, that's entirely pragmatic and necessary. Um, let me get, and, and, and now let me get your 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 view on that as well. Uh, uh, Jay, do you think there should be an exception for war? Do you think a balance of but balance budget? Uh oh, shit. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, maybe you're can kind you, of breaking can you, up. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Do you, can you you can just answer that question verbatim? Can you see it? Do I support a balanced budget amendment? Yeah. Yeah. Do you support uh, a balanced budget amendment? Exceptions for war. I mean, and I think you, you think there should you go ahead. Probably have to have one if you're planning on getting into World War Three. But uh, as far as the wars that we're going to be involved in, you know, unless we go to war with China, we're probably not going to need to take on debt to fight a war. And the thing is, just because you have a balanced budget amendment, you should also be running a surplus. I mean, you don't necessarily have to have exceptions, just run a surplus. You know, if, you, if so, instead of uh, paying down the, I mean, you're, you're making all your mandatory interest payments, but instead of uh, putting the 200 billion surplus into paying down the debt. If you were going into war, put that into a war. Uh, I don't think you necessarily need one. You just have to have an even smaller budget. Right. Um, so I think you could run a surplus, and that way you don't have the the war exception because, like, you know, government would would say, oh, well, you know, this is a national crisis. We have to run a deficit. You know, they would say, oh, we could go to war. You know, they would fi they would find a way to use the war exception for not war, and they just run deficits. So there, I don't think there right. can be any exceptions because any exception there is, they'll use, no matter if it applies or not. I knew you'd say that. Um, I hate you, Jay, but I hate Mike more. Um, but I agree totally with Mike. I would that's what, exactly what the exception I would have brought up. It's the same one that Mike did. That's we agree on most things. 
except um, other than Mike's style choice. I think he's got pretty awful style, but he thinks it's good, whatever. Um, as to the recessions, the government's ability to respond to recessions, government is generally the largest perpetrator of said recessions. I don't, I can't really pinpoint a big recession that hasn't been the fault of government or some sort of government intervention. Um, prior to the Fed, a lot of it were banking laws. Um, a lot of the banking crises that happened here were due to banking laws at the, at, from the national like branching banking system, the unit banking system, I can get into that all day. But the government should have absolutely zero to do with recessions. And I think the balanced budget amendment to limit its spending, how much money it can pull out of the private economy, will certainly help stabilize the economy. That'll be one of the benefits of it. Uh, I don't think you'll see those deep recessions anymore. Um, and I think there'll be less of a need for monetary policy. Because think of it this way, what they're doing is they're spending $1 of government cheese and giving it to the people at the cost of 60 cents and passing the costs on through debt to our children and grandchildren. So basically they're using it to get votes and they're, they're, they're charging our kids and grandkids for it. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, any balance of budget amendment would be great with the caveat of war. Um, so I think that kind of nails it. Um, uh, let's take, we can do one more question. Um, should I get Francis on guys or should I get libertarian conservative? He's here all the time. So let's get let's get him. Let's get let's, let's get, get libertarian. Get Sir, I want to talk to Francis yeah. today. Nah. Yeah, fuck you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get Francis on here, and I'm gonna have Mike answer that question exclusively. Now we should have him. We got one, right? <laughs> Rand Paul has proposed a 700 billion a year tax cut plan, the easy tax, along with a balanced budget amendment. Can can and if somebody can verify this for me on the panel, please go ahead because I haven't heard this yet. That would mean 1.2 trillion a year in spending cuts. Do you guys think this stance will make him unelectable? Um, let me start with Grant, and then I'll go up along the same way. Go ahead, Grant. Well, um, I think it, de it depends on where he takes that cut. Uh, I know that Rand Paul has consistently said that he would rather cut corporate welfare before he cut social programs, and I think that will make him very electable to a lot of people, including those moderate uh, Democrats. Um, however, point. if he there starts you. cutting things willy-nilly that are politically sensitive, like social programs, uh, I, I think that will hurt his electability. Um, I'm not sure how he plans to reform welfare programs. I haven't heard anything specific from him. Um, but I, I don't, to say it would just make him blanket unelectable, I, I don't think it would. Uh, I, I mean, again, it, he would have to detail how he plans to go about that. And I think if he said cut corporate welfare, close the XM bank, that would get a lot of people uh, excited about Rand Paul, especially moderate Democrats. That's a good answer. I mean, what you lack in looks, you certainly make up for in brains. So you can't. Uh... <laughs> Mike, um, to that question, what do you think? I mean, Grant did a good job there. Is there anything that you can add? I, I mean, I doubt it. Usually your answers are very unnuanced and broad ranging. So it sounds like you're smart, but you're really not saying anything. But go ahead and handle this one. I think Grant brought up great points, at least when it comes to his appeal to the left. But I think one of the big problems that he'll have is when he talks about spending cuts to uh, defense spending. And he's going to have to make clear that spending money on the military doesn't equal a good military. I think that's one thing that he's failed at. He, he's, he talks about, hey, we had to cut this sacred cow, and that pisses off a lot of conservatives. But he's got to make clear, he's like, look, you know, just because the government spends money on it, just like anything else, doesn't mean that it's good. You, he's got to make clear that, you know, maybe I'll cut spending by $200 billion on the, on the military, but when I do that, it's going to be more efficient and we'll be more ready to fight wars or defend the country than we would have been had we just kept throwing money at it wastefully. So I think he's got to make that clear. And if he does, I think he can appeal, like Grant said, to a lot of different groups, and it, and it could be a winning strategy for him. Right. I agree. That's a good. I'm surprised. Actually, I'm not surprised. You usually give pretty good answers because they're the ones I would usually give. But that makes you a neocon. Um, yeah. Jay, uh, this the same no, question. No, no. If you know, do you think this is too? Uh, the, the budget cuts are too deep. Do you think this is going to be unappealing, or do you think that everybody, you know, uh, falls for this liberal line of tax cuts for the rich, trickle down economics, or do you think? I mean, what, what do you think here? Do you think the, the, the cuts will appeal to people? Yes. Me? 
Can you, I'm can sorry, you Jake. Broke up last can you see the Can you see that question um, up on top of the screen? Okay, answer that. Yeah. Yeah, I I can see that. It's definitely unappealing because yeah, that's the left is already is going to start running things saying you know he's cutting taxes for the rich, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, it's it's going to be unappealing for forty five percent that are going to vote Democrat no matter what. The question is whether that typical anti-tax cut, you know, the you know, Republicans are for the rich propaganda will work on the 10% that are in the middle of the independents. That's the question. Um, and that just depends on whether people are willing to put in the five minutes to actually read the tax plan or if they're going to read an article on the Huffington Post that says, you know, Rand Paul's bailing out the fat cats and yada yada. Um, so the question is, is it really appealing to that 10 percent and Rand Paul can make it appealing to them. You know, he can he can say this is going to give you more money to run your business. This is going to give me more money to save for your children's college fund. I mean, he can make it appealing. It's going to be hard. Um, I don't think it makes him unelectable. It's difficult, but it's definitely necessary. I mean, that's what we need to cut a trillion dollars. You know, Brett Ron Paul budget in 2012 cut one trillion exactly so cutting one point true cutting 1.2 you know is, is just i don't i mean do i so i'm really glad that he can he continue i don't think it's enough budget. to be honest but <laughs> but i mean i do i think it'll appeal to people yes i i think so i mean reagan right <laughs> reagan ran on i mean you know, libertarians don't believe in right. government i mean the government should be spending zero for example reagan ran on deep tax cuts in 1980 uh, but no, one two one point two is definitely yes. a great start. Reagan ran on tax cuts in nineteen eighty or seventy nine and eighty. He uh, on deep tax cuts and won. I don't see how, I don't see why it wouldn't be appealing. Um, that was after the economic malaise of the late seventies, a malaise that is somewhat similar to now. We have tepid growth. Um, we've had I think it's been at two percent, which has been our average, which is which is not a recovery. We still haven't recovered home sales. We haven't recovered. Uh, pre-recession um, uh, wages. It's it's one of the worst. I think it's the worst recovery in American history since World War II. So I think this would be a huge. That's officially economy. what it is. Yes. So I. So I think that would be a huge boost to a struggling, nightmarish economy. I I don't know, Mike. Did I was I talking to you? I don't know. I don't think it was the last show. I think we were talking about the tepid economic numbers that we got this month. That there was uh, slow growth, 156,000 jobs created. They just came up with the, the numbers on Friday, so it couldn't have been last week. But I don't know if it was you. But the economic numbers are looking pretty grim. Um, and if you consider the work, the workforce particip the labor force participation is very low. It's the lowest it's been in nearly 40 years. So I think something has to be done, and I think it can be sold pretty easily. Um, so I think Ron Paul, Rand Paul, has a definite chance at selling that. Um, did any of you guys see the economic numbers? Was that you I was talking to about that, Grant? Yeah, it was me you were talking to about it. We were, I forgot what I was, was in between. Oh, we were talking about something. That was, uh, that was in between you asking, asking me to chat. come to Philly? Yeah, you kept saying, come uh, to I, Philly, and I was like, I have nowhere to stay. You to come to Philly. No, you, were, <laughs> you said to me, come to Philly, I'll buy your ticket, stay with me. And then I said, I, all right. You know, oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And then you no said, food. I remember that. Oh, yeah, that's right. You said you don't have a couch, but you have a, you have a single bed. And that you, you said you would just sit on, you would sit on my face. Or, I don't know, something weird. It got a little, I got a little weird, weird, and we haven't talked. We haven't talked since, but... Um, <laughs> Let me get a McC I gotta get yeah. McCloskey on here for. Uh, oh yeah, we gotta get a McCloskey question in first. Oh, I gotta get one for Jay. This is exclusively for Jay. Oh. This is a great question. It's very nuanced. Great. Um, he's just. I'm gonna read this out loud to you, Jay. So give me a second. A libertarian future should be never exclamation point. Leftism forever. Also, I do not want Rand Paul as my president exclamation. He hates gay people. <laughs> Ooh. And he thinks the poor should be left to die of dehydration. Oh, he got very specific. Um, he must have said something about, I think Rand Paul wants to ban water. Not of anything else. As for libertarians, which Rand Paul really isn't, because it seems that Frank McCloskey would know. I keep calling him Frank, but it's Francis. I, I, what, what do they call you? I'll just call you Francis. I will make sure that they forever remain irrelevant. They're, uh, and it just cuts off. I think he probably got, he ran out of country. ideas. 
So what do you think about that? Do you think <laughs> Rand Paul hates gay people? And why specifically does he want people to die of dehydration? Go. Uh, I thought libertarians hated roads. I'm, I don't know. Maybe they hate water now, too. We hate uh, public water utilities, I, I guess, because we hate yeah, uh, public I mean, roads. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I guess the that, that's the new thing. So we, we hate we hate water now. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. There you go. So uh, yeah, uh, libertarians again. I'm gonna Mike off here. Uh, Mike's so. got to run, but follow being liberal logic. <laughs> and Mike, are, are you writing for anybody right now? Uh, well, we're 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 starting a writing project up, but I'm pretty sure we're not allowed to reveal it yet. I know you know what I'm talking yeah. about, so we'll just yeah. Uh, I don't. Th We'll just, so we'll talk about that probably in the next week. All right. And next week, I want to remind you guys, um, Jeffrey Tucker's coming on. Um, he'll be on next week. And also, he's going to be on tonight on the Carrie Wedler live show at 9 Eastern. Uh, Tucker will be on there tonight. Um, you can go ahead and go, Mike. We're going to make fun of you when you're gone. I know I am. I'm probably going to get fired up and call you names because you deserve it. And uh, tell your grandmother I said good night. I will do that. For me. All right, get lost. All right. Um, you know what? What time is it? It's 5.11. We should wrap it up. I just want to remind everybody, too, to follow a Libertarian Future. It's a great page. Jay is a great writer, um, despite the fact that his shirt is stupid, and um, I don't necessarily like him very much. But he does good work. His, his, his website's excellent. It's really well done. Um, I went there a few times. I had my pants on uh, each one of those times, Thank except you. for one. But I don't want to talk about that. Um, also, Grant, you got to Grant. Where can they find your your McDonald's uh, piece? That was really good. Uh, so I write for the Libertarian Republic, which you can find all my work on my page at the Modern Libertarian, and I also write for We Are Capitalists, which is a great page. I'm um, here representing them. We Are Capitalists. Be sure to follow that one. Uh, we debunk a lot of your shit, McCloskey, talking to you. Uh, and, so, yeah, follow along with us, guys. And 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 you, Jay, a Libertarian Future is your website's name, too, right? <laughs> Jay, can you hear me? Hmm? Your website is a Libertarian yeah. Future, too? I... Yeah. Libertarian, uh, libertarian libertarian future. Future. Com. Great website. I think everybody should... Give it a look over. Don't believe anything you see on there, but give it a look over. And uh, just <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, uh, we are capitalists. Huge contributor to the show. Grants with we are capitalists. I I, I don't think I, I failed to mention that. So you can read his stuff at we are capitalists too. Jason Hubbard, who is my life partner, also <laughs> at we are capitalists. He won't admit it. We are privy to the to the domestic partnership laws in California. However, we're still. We're still fighting the crusade to get the word marriage attached to it because we don't that's really care about the same. That's right. Well, we get those already, but we just want the word marriage. So screw you, world. And uh, have a great night. Thanks for showing up. We all hate roads and aqueducts. Um, and uh, good luck getting water. Oh, well. Yeah, we hate Jay water. And I, we're, no we're really, <laughs> <laughs> Jay and I, we're really. Libertarians. Jay and I are actually running out of water, and it has nothing to do with libertarians, but everything to do with the big government statists and the environmentalists, <laughs> the enviro Nazis in California. Then that they won't let the water, uh, they won't have water allocated by the price structure because, you know, that's too capitalist. You know, that's, that's favoring the rich people. So no water is better. All right. Thanks to Jay. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll have you on again. I'm gonna I'm gonna get even I'm gonna get even more fired up sure the next time and probably call you names. So let's get that geared up. Let's grab a beer sometime. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're doing hey, later, but let's grab a beer, and hang do out. Don't, don't hang out with him. Yeah, you don't. Know, probably better off not. Um, but let's hang out <laughs> soon. And Grant, I hate you. Go Jets. Your shirt is stupid, and the Mets are ten times better than the Phillies will ever be. Have you seen that pitching rotation? Yeah. Go Mets. Sorry, pal. I don't fucking care about baseball. No one gives a shit. Yeah, about oh, what no say, one Jay. cares. No, I, if my team was as bad as the Phillies, I would say I didn't care either. So, <laughs> I. Good call. All right, good night, right. everybody. Thank you. Fuck you, Will. Thanks, See guys. Later, Thanks, Jesse. Bye. All right, guys. Sign Have a good one. Get lost, Grant. Get lost. He's gone. See that? Gone. Jay, thanks again. Adios.